and also agricultural chaplain for the Diocese of St Edmundsbury and Ipswich. And she's going to, well, she's very kindly agreed to give us our thought for today. Thank you, Sally. Well, first of all, thank you very much for asking me. And I was just saying, I'd really love to stay and listen to your debate, which looks so interesting. But it so happens with another charity I have to do with, which some of you will have heard of, the Royal Coffee Caravan. We have got a Golden Age Fair on just up the road at um, Woodbridge, so I shall shoot out of here, change the image, and go back to that. So, but I'm here primarily as agricultural chaplain, and I want to think a little bit about our agricultural county. And I have got some notes, so I don't go on too long, so it's all right. It is indeed a holy thing to farm the good earth, and the soil has its holiness too. And that's a quote from a prayer from the foot and mouth disease days. The soil, that special gift that our farmers steward and care for, use and feed as part of the task of caretaking the land in each generation. A way of life that, of course, has its wonders and its sadnesses, and has its great times and its truly terrible times. We are a rural agricultural county. It is our backbone. backbone. And however far people nowadays may feel from the land and the work of the farmers and growers to produce food. It is the backbone of our, la of our country to work God's uh, soil, to conserve making green corridors and to make wildlife a part of all that we do. I was delighted with the meeting some farmers and I had with the Archbishop of Canterbury when he visited last year to see how clearly he understood that a farmer's task is to grow food, but also to run a business successfully, and that conservation run, runs hand in hand with that if the growing of the food is to work properly. But sometimes, through no fault of their own, Things can go wrong. You will remember 2000's classical swine fever. And the cause for that was never truly found, although it was suspected to be a sandwich carelessly thrown down a footpath with ham that was contaminated not from this country. And then that was followed so swiftly by foot and mouth disease. And then blue tongue, brought in by midges, or TB, which we'd better not dwell on because that has become rather political, or floods, or rain. And this year, in some places, there is still standing corn and beans, and the wheat, of course, is shedding and becomes almost valueless, and the land's too wet to get on. So much rain, and that's not bad management, that is just rain, circumstances. So that is where the charities come in. The Addington Fund, one of your chairman's chosen charities, and thank you very much for that, which we began in this county during swine fever, and then it went national during foot and mouth disease and is now nearly 15 years old our little charity from Suffolk grown up and so along with the Farming Community Network FCN and the Royal Agricultural Benevolent Institute they've done so much together in times of disaster the Somerset levels for example the floods that we saw that, that were so disastrous. And they were all working together under the banner of farming help, getting fodder out to the livestock, making welfare payments to families, Addington making payments for fodder, and FCN driving vehicles getting it out. 
all backed up by the young farmers who did such a wonderful job and the NFU and by people across the county who saw and understood and farmers in other parts of the country wanting to help and send fodder and people in our towns as they did during the beginning of the Addington Fund sending money to help. And the Addington Fund now helps those who retire with housing so that they can remain in their local villages. And it means that that helps to move on and give other generations a chance. With FCN supporting people through difficult times. And of course, uh, as a spin-off from the FCN, there was the Rural Coffee Caravan as we became aware of rural loneliness and the much longer established RABI, which does such a lot, not only for domestic welfare, and of course for the amazing Manson House in Bury St. Edmunds, which is wonderful, isn't it? So, there they are, the safety net, as somebody once said, the safety net under the trap door. Help that we all hope won't be needed. A rural county, which you as the county council don't do so much to make a good place to live and work in. But we should, all of us, always, I believe, be mindful and thankful for those who keep the wheels of agriculture turning, who grow the food, who keep our green and pleasant land and keep our people fed. And it is, indeed, a holy thing to farm the good earth. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, councillors. Councillors, officers and members of the public, uh, may I wish you all a welcome back to uh, the County Council. And i particularly like to welcome back Councillor Peter Byatt. Uh, yeah. after a long it's, uh, it's very good to see you. Uh, we have missed you. Even on, us, even on that side, they've missed you. <laughs> And I'd also like to welcome um, Councillor Peter Belfield, who hasn't been well, but he's back here today. Good to see you too. Um, can I remind you all to put your phones to silent? Uh, uh, otherwise, there's a very hefty fine to the Chairman's Charities. <laughs> um, and uh, a reminder that an audio recording is being made of the meeting and will be published on the website. Um, and uh, just for uh, clarity, I do like to be called Chairman or Madam Chairman, so we'll get that out of the way straight away. Uh, um, as, as for my other announcements, uh, I, just, uh, I have a, a couple of very sad announcements to make. Uh, a former county councillor, Howard Simon Charles Bestow, died at his home uh, on the 4th of September, aged 80. Known as Simon, he was elected to Deben No. 3 Division, that sounds like a football team rather than a county council, but uh, in May 1981, and that became the Carlt Carlford Division in 1985. He stood down in 2001. During his time as a county councillor, he served on a range of committees, including Further Youth and Careers, Environment and Protection, Libraries, Museums, Records and Amenities. He was Vice Chairman of Libraries and Heritage Committee in 1985 and Vice Chairman of the Central Services Committee in 1989. 
Professor John Blatchley, MBA, MA, Honorary Doctor of Letters, Fellow of the Society of Anti Antiqui Antiquaries. Antiquaries, thank you very much, died on the 9th of the 3rd of 3rd, 4th of September. Those of you interested in local history will know how invaluable John's contribution was to Suffolk's local history scene, and it is in the light of this that I wanted to mark his passing. In 1983, John was a founder member of the Friends of the Suffolk Record Office, acting as chairman until his retirement when he was made an honorary vice president. He played a key role in raising £250,000 to buy the IV manuscripts for the county and helped the Friends to acquire fine, other fine archives for the record office. Without his support, these archives might have been lost to Suffolk. His dedication to preserving Ipswich's redundant medieval churches was extremely successful, and in just over 18 months, with other Wolsey project patrons, he raised the money to buy, oh, sorry, to pay for a bronze statue commemorating Ipswich's famous son. He will be sadly missed by all those involved in local history in Suffolk, especially by Suffolk Record Office staff and the Friends of the Suffolk Record Office, Suffolk Records Society, Suffolk Institute of Archaeology and History, and Ipswich Historic Churches Trust. I also have to announce a death in service, and it is with regret that I have to inform you of the death in service of Jenny <coughs> Chatfield. Jenny had worked for Suffolk County Council for over nine years, both in public access and in finance in, human, uh, in resource management. Jenny was diagnosed with breast cancer two and a half years ago, and despite having surgery and receiving various ongoing treatments during this time, both locally and at the Royal Marsden, Jenny lost her brave fight on the 26th of July this year. She was just 31 years old. Jenny was much loved and respected by her friends and colleagues at work. She had a strong work ethic, and even when she was having treatment and in a great deal of pain, she, st she constantly spoke of wanting to be normal and returning to work. She will be missed by all who knew her. Would you please join me for a few moments standing to pay tribute to these people? Thank you very much. Um, you will have seen in my um, list of engagements that I went to a Lammas Day service in Hoxton. Um, so I'm delighted to say that uh, the fundraising for the Addington Trust is, has, uh, uh, has really sort of taken off. And uh, at that, I, uh, at the Addington Fund Lammas Service and Hog Roast, at St. Peter and St. Paul's Church, Hoxton. Um, the money raised there was something like £2,309, so uh, it was an amazing amount of money. didn't all come um, from people turning up and, and having a bit of pork, um, but it was, um, it was certainly very uh, well attended. Um, and talking of amazing things, which we were, uh, I just wanted to share something about one of our most treasured officers, um, our Director of resource management, Jeff Dobson, with whom I worked so closely for eight years, has just completed a remarkable feat. Last month, he climbed the last of 282 
Munros, which, as many of you will know, are Scottish peaks over 3,000 feet high. He climbed the first in 1999 and scaled the last two, both... <laughs> both scaled the last two, both in Glencoe, um, 16 years later, in this August. For those of you of a nervous disposition, I would suggest you stop looking at the screens now. He's the one in the shorts. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Actually, he, he did climb a total of 284 peaks, as two peaks have been downgraded since he started, as they are now slightly below 3,000 feet. See, everything shrinks if you leave it long enough. <laughs> he has thus become a completist after years of planning and toil and typical Jeff like determination. I am informed that early in this task he earned the nickname Wobbly Sister due to his perceived insecurity on steep ground. But this name didn't stick for long, as in 2002 he climbed the most difficult and inaccessible Munro on the Isle of Skye without a rope and gained the wholesale admiration of his colleagues. The group of fellow climbers varied slightly over the years, but included from the first his close friend Clive Blanchard, who sadly died in 2011. Clive still had 18 Munros to complete when he died, and I know that Jeff and the remaining group have undertaken to complete these on his behalf. Jeff's third from last Clive, I'm sorry, his third from last Munro was a Clive. I have to confess to you all that I have deliberately not told you the names of the Munros because they're very Gaelic and I couldn't possibly do them justice. But I'm sure Jeff will tell you if, he, uh, if you ask him nicely. He probably might be able to name all 284 as well. I am grateful for this information um, from another of his friends, David Morley, and also to Councillor Richard Smith, uh, for um, drawing my attention to his achievement. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't climb them, obviously, himself. Very, <laughs> I have to say, very well done, Jeff. Well done. <laughs> I wonder what he's going to do now. <laughs> we have, we do have um, some. Uh, I'm sorry, I do have some other announcements. Um, I, uh, I want to inform the council that Sally Hogg, Assistant Director for Public Health, is leaving Suffolk after more than 20 years. We welcomed the public health team uh, into the council in April 2013, which is when Sally became our employee. But for many years prior to that, she had been a stalwart partner to the County Council while she was working as part of the NHS in Suffolk. Sally came to the county as a school nurse working in the Thurston Upper School Pyramid and then the Priory School in Bury St Edmunds, then as a health visitor in Sudbury. She took her clinical skills into the commissioning role of the NHS ten years ago, finding a natural home in public health work. Sally has a thirst for knowledge and is committed to the concept of lifelong learning, recently obtaining her fellowship of the Faculty of Public Health, a faculty of the College, Royal College of Physicians. Well done, Sally. Sally is leaving Suffolk to go to the West Country to be nearer to her children and grandchildren. We wish her well for the move and for her future career and thank her for her considerable contrib contribution to health and well-being in Suffolk. Sally, would you like to stand up and take a bow? <laughs> thank you very much, Sally. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, there's a chairman's quiz next uh, Tuesday, or... I said, the, a chairman's quiz. It's the chairman's quiz next Tuesday. Uh, it starts at six o'clock and uh, do come along and, and uh, help support the uh, raising funds for the chairman's charities. And then just a reminder about the Suffolk Harvest Festival. Um, it's the annual service of praise and thanksgiving for Suffolk's harvest and it will be held in St Edmundsbury Cathedral. 
uh, Bury St Edmunds at 3.30 on Sunday the 11th of October. There was an invitation extended to all councillors and also um, to senior um, officers and their partners and uh, I went out by email earlier in the week. So uh, please come along. It's a, it's a great event and, uh, and, and a terrific celebration. Uh, if you need to um, respond, then please do so to Valerie Hill. Uh, and that concludes my announcements. Uh, we have three apologies for, no, two apologies for absence. Uh, I've received apologies from Stephen Searle and also Julia Trulove. Are there any further apologies? No? Oh, yes, sorry. Councillor Mark. Andrew Councillor and thank you very much. We move, we move on to agenda item four. Declarations of interest and dispensations. Do councillors have any interests to declare? No? Thank you. We'll now move on to agenda item five, the minutes of the previous meeting. It's the uh, minutes of the meeting held on the 16th of July 2015. Is it the wish of, the, of councillors that the minutes be confirmed? Yes? Thank you very much. I'll sign the minutes at the end of the meeting. Agenda item six uh, is public questions. There have been two questions received from the public. The questions and answers will be recorded as part of the minutes of this meeting. I understand that Mr. Soames is not attending the meeting to ask his question in person. I will read out the question and ask Councillor Matthew Hicks to respond. I will then ask Mr. Robertson to come forward and ask his question. So the first question is from uh, Mr. Roger Soames. It's to Matthew Hicks and it's regarding Kirkley Stream flooding. The question is, what action has been taken into Kirkley Stream flooding from the 24th of July as people's lives have been blighted through this flooding and this has been recurrent for residents such as myself? Councillor Hicks, would you like to respond? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, firstly, I'd like to extend my sympathy to all those affected by the flooding that occurred on the 24th and 25th of July. Having visited Lowestoft in the immediate aftermath of the flooding, I was made only too aware of the distress and heartbreak that an event such as this can cause. As outlined in a recent newsletter sent to affected residents, Suffolk County Council is leading the work with partners to complete a flood investigation report as required under Section 19 of the Flood and Water, Ma Water Management Act 2010. This will illustrate the likely causes of flooding, identify where possible the responsible authorities, riparian owners, and make recommendations for ways to reduce flood risk in the future. A draft report will be shared with the residents and partner organisations by the end of October and a public meeting will be held to consider the contents prior to final publication. Meanwhile, a number of actions have been undertaken by the relevant authorities. Suffolk County Council have cleared access to the Kirkley Stream, allowing Anglian water to clear vegetation and fly-tip material, causing blockages within the channel between Bloodmoor Roundabout and Kirkley Fen Park. Suffolk County Council have cleared six pipes that allow water from Kirkby Stream to overflow into a flood storage area. Suffolk County Council has facilitated a visit to the affected properties by the National Flood Forum to assist residents with the practicalities of insurance claims, clear-up and making homes more resilient for the future. And Cotman Housing Association is progressing the refurbishment of its flooded properties. Previously planned work to clear the stream will shortly take place in Carton Colville, undertaken by the Environment Agency and Suffolk County Council, and details of these have been shared with the Town Council in a fact sheet. This work was planned prior to the recent flooding as part of the wider Lowestoft Flood Management Project. This larger project is progressing towards delivering a £30 million plus project to reduce the risk of all forms of flooding, tidal, river, and surface water to the wider areas of Lowestoft. As the flood investigation is currently underway, it would be wrong to preempt its findings at this stage. Suffolk County Council has provided all available information and resources to
to assist this investigation and is working with partners to identify recommendations that will reduce the risk of future flooding in the area. Thank you, Councillor Hicks. Uh, Mr Robertson, would you like to come forward and ask your question now? How does Suffolk County Council expect the Prime Minister's promise for a fair crossing by 2020 to be believed by the population of Lowestoft after the High Rise England officer at the Fair Crossing Steering Group on the 12th of June stated an overview of High Rise England's five year programme confirming a fair crossing over Lake Lothian is not currently included? Thank you, Mr. Robertson. Ms. Councillor Finch, would you like to respond? Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Robertson, for your question. The Department of Transport has asked Suffolk County Council and the New Anglia Local Enterprise Partnership to submit a business case to government by the end of 2015. This is in order that provision may be made for funding within the Chancellor's budget statement in March 2016. The business case being produced will be used to demonstrate the value for money of a third crossing to be delivered by Suffolk County Council, the local highway authority. Now this is the reason why a new crossing is not included in the Highways England programme for trunk road improvements at this stage. Now in developing the business case for the third crossing and taking the project forward to delivery, Suffolk County Council will work very closely with Highways England because of the interrelationship between the trunk road and the local road network in Lowestoft. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Finch. Mr Robertson, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yes. I thank Councillor Finch for his answer. I note that Councillor Finch talks about the business case needs to be set out by the end of the year. Can he confirm that there will be a full cost to benefit ratio on the following options within the business case to be submitted to the government? The Peter Colby's lock and barrage idea, a tunnel under Lake Lovin and a conventional trunk rope bridge, please. Councillor Finch. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I... I can't give you that information this afternoon, but I will get back to you. But I am assured that all options are looked at in the business case. And because the way these are put forward, the best business case will be presented. Thank you both very much. Uh, that concludes the public questions, and we'll now move on to agenda item seven. In accordance with rule 3.1 of the Constitution, three motions have been received. The wording of the motions is on pages three and four of your agenda pages. I would remind councillors to refrain from repetition, please. It's going to be a long enough day without that. A bell will sound 30 seconds before your allotted time, and I will look forward to you winding up as soon as possible after that. The first motion, motion one, is proposed by Councillor Joanna Spicer and seconded by Councillor Mark B. The Ministry of Justice is currently consulting on proposals to close a number of law courts in Suffolk, including magistrates' courts and family courts in Bury St Edmunds and Lowestoft. This council objects to these proposed closures. We therefore request that Suffolk County Council responds to the consultation outlining the various concerns held by councillors and the effect we believe they will have on the people of Suffolk. Councillor Joanna Spicer, uh, you have five minutes to speak. Would you like to propose the motion? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for reading that out, which saves a couple of seconds. Uh, colleagues, 800 years is a long time in the history of Suffolk, but the connection between that meeting that was held in Bury St Edmunds in November 2014 and our meeting here today of the full council for the whole of the county of Suffolk should indeed focus us on this important issue. 800 years ago, 801 actually, nearly, the barons of England drew up the clauses of Magna Carta here in Suffolk, in our county, and something that we shouldn't just be proud of in our history, 
but something that we should be able to honour and respect today and discharge the responsibilities to hold to those sentiments and fine words of Magna Carta, those that have stood the test of time. I'm talking about Clause 39. It's still the basis of how we give all our citizens a right to justice, and at the heart of that is around equality under the law. Even the ten minutes I'm allowed for this... Oh, it's five, actually, isn't it? Now I thought it was ten. I thought it was ten when I wrote it. I allowed for this speech. So I'm not going to read out Magna Carta, and nor will I even read that clause, but I urge you to respect those words, equality under the law. Because local delivery of justice is about far more than a geographical location. It's about a system presided over by local magistrates, supported by local police, local probation officers, local statutory services like this county council. And it, in my view, it's about equal, ensuring equality of the service provided. Now, that's about whether you're old or young, employed or unemployed, a victim, a witness, a defendant, whether you have a car, whether you rely on public transport, and whether you're supported by friends and relatives. Equality under the law is everyone's right, and these proposals would seek to remove that for the people of Suffolk. The formal consultation closes on the 8th of October. When I first looked at it, I was a bit shocked. In fact, I had to check that I got it right, one, because Suffolk is apparently part of South East England region. That was news to most of you. And to add further insult to our county, we're one of only six that will be left with one, one court just in one town. Um, and why should Norfolk have three? By the way, we should be friends with Norfolk at the moment, but I don't see why they should have three courts and we should have one, and why should Essex have four? And the proposal in the consultation is to close the magistrates' courts and the family courts in both Bury St Edmunds and Lowestoft. I reckon that affects about at least half the population of our county. They also propose to make use of courts in Norwich and Great Yarmouth, and I know that's of concern to JPs. I have studied the sections and got them here on Lowestoft and Bury St Edmunds, to put it politely, the information provided by the Department of Justice is quite frankly deeply flawed and rather inadequate, or somewhat less politely, it's pretty tosh. Furthermore, I would have actually expected Michael Gove, who I, I must say I do admire enormously, to have had the typos and the bad English and bad grammar corrected before it came out. I'm going to give you three examples of why this is serious. First is about travel times, and I hope members will be able to illustrate more of that. All the travel times referred to in the document are only from Bury St Edmunds to Ipswich. Excuse me, only about a quarter of the population of West Suffolk live in Bury St Edmunds. What about all our rural villages, let alone the big towns like Sudbury, Newmarket, Milton Hall, Brandon? Sorry, that, I did have Haverhill down. I'm being rushed. I've had constituents write to me describing the torturous journey by bus and train in order to get to Ipswich, and none of them could do it in less than two and a half hours. And, of course, you may find, if you're relying on that, that you're travelling in the same public transport um, as a victim um, as a, or, or as a defendant. Secondly, I want to talk about the financial costs that are missing. They tell us no information on capital... They give us operating costs, but no um, what the um, redundancy costs of staff, and nor are they giving any indication of praying for travel. It's got a big impact on Suffolk County Council, and I'll talk about that when I'm allowed to come back later. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Spicer. Um, I now call upon Councillor Mark B to second the motion. Do you wish to speak now or reserve your right to speak later? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have pleasure in seconding this motion and would like to reserve my right to speak until later in the debate. Thank you very much. Do we have uh, uh, somebody from the opposition to speak? Yes? Councillor Barker. Thank you. 
What Councillor Spicer fails to mention is that the government has reduced legal aid to such an extent that now far fewer people are able to facilitate legal services. There is an irrefutable link between the cuts to legal aid and the decline of the business of local solicitors' firms through to the proposal from the Ministry of Justice to close the local courts complex in Lowestoft. Increasingly, without the legal aid, which has been cut dramatically since 2013, with more cuts having been made this year, less people are able to get state-funded legal advice, therefore are less able to use their local solicitors. Under the coalition government, significant changes to civil legal aid in England and Wales came into effect in 2013 as part of a reform to the system to save £350 million a year. The changes meant some types of case were no longer eligible for public funds, including divorce, child contact, welfare benefits, employment, clinical negligence and housing law. Therefore, there's less business for local solicitor firms. This means people can no longer get funding for divorce or child conduct or resident disputes, which is why there is less use of the courts, family courts, county courts and magistrates' courts for these cases. Having listened to our local solicitors and the damage this reduction in legal aid has already inflicted, it is obvious that the Ministry of Justice's proposals are another nail in the coffin of locally administered justice. Without legal aid, few people are able to utilise help from solicitors unless they are able to personally fund that help. So this is unjust and it is an, illiquid, it is an unequal access to law in so many ways. Although Councillor Spicer and Councillor B may be working really hard with the Waveney MP, Mr Aldous, to keep our courts open, with the increasing decline in legal aid, the position of the law firms, indeed the courts, may well be an untenable one, as fewer and fewer people can afford legal advice and services. Thus, they are taking with one hand and giving to another, making their support of the local courts and law firms to not close, somewhat futile. Lastly, in the consultation document, I totally agree with Councillor Spicer that the Ministry of Justice times that are given for how long it would take defendants, victims, witnesses, solicitors and families to travel to courts further afield, i.e. from Lowestoft to Ipswich or Lowestoft to Norwich or to Great Yarmouth, when a time of 20 minutes is given by the Ministry of Justice to get from Lowestoft to Great Yarmouth and thinking back to questions about the bridge here, when in reality it can take up to an hour to cross three bridges, a lake and two rivers to get to the Great Yarmouth Court complex, which is to the north of the town, it just underlines the complete lack of in-depth research that has gone into these Ministry of Justice proposals. In fact, if it wasn't so serious, it would be laughable that they have presented their case and quite frankly, when you read through it, as Councillor Spicer says, there's a complete lack of draft reading and editing. You know, it's almost as though somebody did it as a GCSE work experience project. These proposals should be roundly opposed as they will cause injustice, inequality, financial hardship and business decline, particularly in Lowestoft, which needs all of the business it can get right now. As in the last six weeks, two large companies in the town centre have shut down. These ill-thought-through proposals should be roundly opposed as the Ministry of Justice will become known as the Ministry of Injustice and Business Decline. So we should all support the motion. Thank you very much, Councillor Barker. I now call upon Councillor Richard Kemp Right, thank you, Madam Chairman. How many minutes do I get, please? Can you? Three. Goodness me, I'll be quick. Uh, I started on the courts in West Suffolk in 1976, and I served for 36 years. When I first served, we had five courts that we went to in West Suffolk. Now, of course, we're down to Berry Court. I think this is a, an attack on the fabric of this country, the historic fabric. And I'm sorry to say this government 
seem to be hell bent on it because the reasons they give are totally unjustified. Uh, the economics, to start with, it may be economic from the government's perspective, but is it economic for the people we represent? If we have one court in Suffolk, I suggest that isn't the case. And the joke of this really is devolution. Are we going to study devolution, power to the people, control at local level, and we're closing courts, so we'll have one court in Suffolk? I urge you to support this motion because I think the government should think again because in every direction they are incorrect. They attack Berry as not being used. Two years ago was the last time I sat in Berry, and we sat sometimes till seven o'clock at night and then cases were put over because there was not enough time to hear the cases. So where this fabrication comes from, I do not know. But from my perspective, it is not true. So please support this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. I now call upon Councillor Sarah Stamp. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, I believe in local justice for local people administered by local people as magistrates, and that's why I'm very happy to support this motion to protect our courts in Berry and Lowestoft. There is genuine, strong and heartfelt opposition to these proposed closures across our county. Such is the strength of opposition from our residents that four of our county's MPs were moved to jointly write a letter to the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, Michael Gove, raising the very real concerns around these closures. I believe we need to add our council's strong voice to theirs. Firstly, access to justice for, for me means exactly this, that all of our residents should have easy access to a magistrate's court, not that our county should become, as it will, as Councillor Spicer has already alluded to, one of only six counties nationwide to operate a single magistrate's court if these proposals go ahead. Suffolk is vast, it's rural, and the people of Suffolk deserve better than a potential trip for some of up to 45 miles simply just to access the justice system, a trip which, as has already been said, isn't easy for many of our more rural areas. The impact of these closures in terms of added cost, travel time, stress, anxiety for witnesses, defendants and family members is significant. My second point is that as Cabinet Member responsible for trading standards, I believe the proposed closure of these two courts would have an impact on this service. Trading standards have used the county's courts to bring 34 cases in the past two years, with cases ranging from rogue traders, car clocking, animal-related cases, counterfeit, product safety, underage sales, fraud, and so on and so forth, cases which have all helped to keep our Suffolk residents safer. Half of the underage drinking cases brought in the last two years were heard at Bury St Edmunds Magistrates Court. You may not be aware that trading standards also use our courts to get authorisation to carry out directed surveillance for Facebook and other online sellers and underage sales test purchasing. Our trading standards team often need to act quickly when they have specific intelligence, and it's therefore a concern to me that more pressure on the courts could affect their ability to obtain these authorisations in a timely manner. My final point is this. There are genuine concerns around the capacity of the local justice system and the ability of the one remaining court to cope with extra demands that would inevitably occur as a result of closing two others. There has been media coverage recently which claims that cases heard in England's Magistrates Court take, currently take 149 days on average to complete. That is a week longer than four years ago. My point being that the system nationwide is already under significant pressure and demand in Suffolk is no less than that. Extra pressure on an already creaking justice system has the potential to cause our trading standards team significant extra work, especially when court dates are rearranged and or delayed. And it's difficult to see how moving caseloads from Bury St Edmunds and Lowestoft to the one court at Ipswich would do anything other than put extra pressure on the system. There are alternatives to simply closing the magistrates' court. Across the county, we have genuine proven examples of the public sector sharing buildings and delivering savings in the West. I know the offer has been made for the court in Bury St Edmunds to investigate becoming part of the one public sector estate. I urge colleagues to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stamp. Uh, we now have Councillor Gordon Jones. <coughs> uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, with my cabinet responsibility, I just want to give my support uh, to this motion. The vast majority of the public believe that access to justice is a fundamental right. And indeed, in a survey, most believe more important than free health care at the point of use or state pensions. 
The current proposals by the Ministry of Justice is to leave Suffolk with just one location for courts, namely Ipswich with the closures of Berry and Lowestoft courts. Colchester County and Family Courts also face closure. The proposal is fundamentally flawed and could deny the public access to the justice which they hold in such high regard. My particular concern is for the families and young as the family courts are included in these proposals of closure, which if carried through will mean just one location for family courts serving a population of over 728,000, so that's at the 2011 census, compared to three in Norfolk for a population of just under 858,000 at the same census. Norfolk, for only a 17.8% increase in population, <coughs> will have 200, 200% more in the number of courts. And I understand regarding area, Suffolk will have the worst coverage in England. This is basically unfair and cannot be allowed to happen. Reducing the number of courts in Suffolk will mean that families or staff who do not live in or near Ipswich will spend considerable time and expense in attending a court, and with less capacity in the system, there will be more delays. For families, this will make the process even more stressful than it already is. We have already seen the loss of the, fam the family judge for just Suffolk, with the result of families and staff already having to travel more frequently to Chelmsford for the court's convenience. I strongly believe that the Council should put up a robust, robust response to the proposals, and I will be encouraging the Family Justice Council to do likewise. I will be supporting this motion, and I, all, and I urge all members to do likewise. Thank you. I'm Jim. Thank you. Councillor Beckworth. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I should declare a non pecuniary interest, as so should Richard. Uh, we're both retired members of the West Suffolk bench. Um, Richard did twice as long as I did. I, I was appointed in 96, and the landscape was very, very different than, as, as he's already pointed out. We had courts in Bury, Stone Market, Haverhill, Mildenhall, Sudbury, Newmarket. Across the border in Thetford, Plus, we had a Crown Court sitting in Bury as well. Not every day, but we had a Crown Court. So that's significant. And I'll go back to what other members have raised. The principle of local justice by local people was relatively intact in those days. It's that principle that makes this proposal so wrong. The importance of local knowledge when dealing with cases, particularly trials, can't be overemphasised. The usual bench of three, drawn from the local community, virtually ensures that local knowledge is present. To quote, and this is from the history of Justices of the Peace, it's, it's, it's got a lot of good facts in it, and it's a, 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 a boxed set of three. I'm referring to the very early days of the magistracy. A notable feature of the system was that it was based upon the voluntary part-time unpaid service of the landed gentry. We didn't fit that bit, but... <laughs> it, it, in the shires and all prominent citizens of the towns. They were influ influential men, because women weren't in the magistracy then, with local ties, that's the important bit, and involvement, who, for the most part, took a close personal interest in the affairs of their, their area and its population. So even going back hundreds and hundreds of years, it's down there. I heard yesterday the minister, um, when he was quizzed by a couple of Suffolk MPs, claiming to mitigate the impact with measures, measures such as video conferencing, but that won't compensate, compensate for the sobering effect of a court appearance. Except, accepted that appearance for some is almost routine, but to many, particularly new offenders, it can have a desired deterrent effect where, you know, their first appearance happens to be their last, and that shouldn't be um, forgotten in all this. We've already had a mention of the extended travelling to court and trying to get from um, some of these far-flung villages via Berry into Ipswich, which is ridiculous. During the 2010 election campaign, Mr Cameron regaled us regularly on matters judicial. He emphasised that his mother had served for a long time as a magistrate. To some, this gave confidence that the magistracy was safe under his government, but that confidence now has got to be shaken. This really is a cut too far, and for the good of many people served by the proposed closure of these important courts, it must be resisted. A process that has evolved over 650 years can't be just ditched like that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Beckwith. Uh, can I just reiterate that um, I'd remind councillors to refrain from repetition. Thank you very much. I now call upon um, Councillor Guy McGregor. That's half, half my speech, uh, Madam Chairman, so very briefly in those circumstances. Quite rightly, we focus on the size of Suffolk. It's a long way from Brandon to Brantham. It's a long way from Newmarket to Lowestoft and all the rest of it. So it's a big county with good needs. We have a mishmash of courts at various locations that has been stated. But what we need is a more sophisticated approach to the needs of justice and the family courts in Suffolk, which this consultation paper painfully does not address. The issue also, in fact, has been tried by one's peers. I've got no disrespect for, for Ipswich, but in fact, the only number of people we'll be able to serve as volunteers on this, I would suggest, are those people clear enough to, to, to Ipswich to make their input. Very difficult for people in Bury and, and Lowestoft and beyond to become Justice of the Peace, and so the quality of justice, in my view, will be diminished. I was pleased to hear Peter Aldis's contribution in the House of Commons debate the other day. It seems to me this is purely a cost-saving exercise, but unfortunately, the additional cost cost shunt before one of those people who have to go to these courts, not just the defendants, but everything else which goes with it, the solicitors and their advisers. So it seems to me we are pound wise and, and pence foolish and all the rest of it here if we do this. So we deserve a more sophisticated approach to the administration of justice in Suffolk. These proposals are just simply slash and burn and the Minister must come up with better proposals. I thoroughly support and fully support this particular motion. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McGregor. I now call upon Councillor Sandy Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very short. Um, we totally approve and agree with this motion. Um, I particularly want to say that I absolutely agree with every word that was said by Councillor Stamp. I think she put it extremely well. Um, and uh, I just wanted to remind you of two things. First of all, that this is a proposal coming out of a Conservative government. And secondly, that exactly the same arguments that you've applied to courts also apply uh, to children's centres, to the police service, and to everything else that is being cut. We believe that public services properly administered can be preventative, can produce a better society, and we're not entirely clear that you actually believe that. But we will be supporting this motion. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Nettleton. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, this is a closure too far, which has been said by many. Uh, I, I think that we should look at the aspects of the, the Ministry of Justice are doing this to save money on buildings, I think. So I think when we look at Bury St Edmunds, which is the only one I can speak about, is that uh, we have an option here for Phase 2 of the public, um, sex of, public service village, which may be a way in which they could actually keep the courts in Bury whilst actually not uh, expending a lot of money on buildings, which they claim are not very well used, but as Richard Kemp has pointed out, the Berry Court is very well used. Um, so I think their argument is flawed on that. So I would say we should definitely all support this uh, motion. I don't know about the lowest off angle, but I'm sure they've got the same problems there. The other thing is, of course, we've got lowest off Berry and Ipswich a long way apart, and Ipswich is in the southeast. It's quite a long way to come. It takes me an hour, and I live right next to the railway station. So it, people who live in the rural villages are going to take a lot longer. So I think we should uh, support this motion, and I hope it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Tony Brown. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> I think we all uh, support this motion, and it would be a tragedy if last off and bury uh, magistrates' courts uh, closed. Should, should we, as a county council, look at ways that financially we can support the Ministry of Justice in keeping these uh, courts open? Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor B, do you wish to speak now? Thank you very much indeed, um, Madam Chairman, and I'll also try and uh, avoid too much repetition. I'm glad that there has been some uh, cross-party uh, support on this, because I think it's very important. And I think that uh, at times, in Suffolk, this Suffolk County Council has to speak up for Suffolk and put party politics to one side. And I think that this is one such occasion as that. I think it's also important that we listen to others in this field, like the Police and Crime Commissioner who has raised concerns about this, the local police, the Police Federation, the Law Society for Suffolk and North Essex, and the Lowestoft solicitors. And of course, as Councillor McGregor has already mentioned, there was the Westminster Hall debate yesterday, led by Peter Aldous and Joe Churchill. 
Now, I just want to just pick on one or two facts which I think are key to this in urging you all to support it. Back in the early 1990s, there were 12 magistrates' courts in Suffolk. Now the proposal is for one, one in Ipswich. And nothing against Ipswich being the county town, but as we've heard, it is about geography. It is about access to justice. It is about access in a county that doesn't necessarily have the road networks and the support networks through public transport that you would want. Suffolk would be the worst English county, as we heard uh, earlier, in having magistrates' courts. It would work out as this, that we would have one magistrates' court for every 1,466 square miles. Now, this compares with Norfolk, which would have one for every 692 square miles, and Essex, one in every 355 square miles, and Cambridge, one in every 655 square miles. So you can see how the difference would be for Suffolk and how we would have worse access to justice. Now, the Ministry of Justice, in that consultation document, have talked about the need for 95% of citizens to be, within, to be within one hour distance of justice. And as Councillor Barker said earlier and others have said, you will not do that by where you are proposing to do it here. And it will be those who are socially deprived. It will be those in areas of social deprivation who will suffer worst from this. Because we don't have those direct transport links to Ipswich that would mean that you could fulfil that hours requirement. The other thing that I would like to mention is about this idea of um, us having the worst access to public uh, to the, uh, the justice system, which could lead to many more failed trials because people would fail to show. That would in itself cost money. Now, of course, we've heard um, from Councillor Nettleton about Bury St Edmunds Court, and I'd like to speak very um, simply about Lowestoft Court as well, which has ha received a, an enormous amount of refurbishment in the last few years. I think there's been over a million pounds worth of refurbishment, and it seems crazy to having spent that money on what is now a state-of-the-art facility with all the latest um, uh, ability to hold potential, um, potential uh, criminals. It also has all the video conferencing facilities to then close all of that down. It does not make sense at all. So I think we need to send a very strong message as a county council, and I think we need to do it cross-party, as I'm glad to hear we are doing, so that our, our robust response will be listened to, and that we, in speaking up for the people of Suffolk, say no, this is a cut too far. We do not want to see this happen. We want to see the maintenance of the structure that we have at the moment. I urge all members to support this motion. Let's send that clear message, and let's make sure that this doesn't happen. Thank you. Um, councillors, I have an apology to make because I, I, I missed uh, Councillor Evans uh, indicating to me that she wanted to speak. So with your indulgence, I will ask her to speak now. Then it will be uh, Councillor Spicer to sum up. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my experience at the Magistrates' Court is in the, my early 20s. I spent a couple of years in and out of the county's Magistrates' Courts. I hasten to add on the press bench, not on the dock. <laughs> But one of the factors we haven't considered today, that in a way, part of the key element of the delivery of local justice is actually the local accountability and the reporting in the local press. The Berry Free Press still, these days, carries the page, very brief outlines of the cases, but people then know what has happened. I don't suppose the Berry Free Press is going to send a reporter over to Ipswich because there won't be a total West Suffolk list on any one day. I don't see how the magistrates' clerks will be able to manage a list so you get three West Suffolk magistrates sitting on a bench with all West Suffolk cases. It won't happen. It'll be the next case on the list. Another fear I have, the MOJ says we're going to have more remand cases dealt with by video link. Now, I'm very wary of that. It was after I left these Daniel Daily Times. Not a widely known case, but it was appalling. A remand prisoner arrived in Ipswich Magistrates Court with injuries. The magistrates were so concerned they went to the chief constable. I'm not sure those injuries would necessarily show up on a video link. And you can't have people being bounced down steps. It's just not, you know, it's, it was an appalling case. So I think we're going to lose local links. 
and we're going to lose that essence of people understanding justice locally. Now, in my neck of the woods, there is a distance, but I can assure you, people in Coolidge, people in Clare, people in Cavendish don't see Ipswich as local. There's nothing wrong with Ipswich. I was born here. Nothing wrong with the Ipswich bench. My dad was chairman for years, but it's not local to most of Suffolk. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Evans, and I do apologise for missing you out. Uh, Councillor Spicer. Uh, Chairman, and how good um, to have a debate from all round here of of how something um, so important will impact on the people of Suffolk and, indeed, um, on the services provided here. Uh, Thank you all for your contributions. Um, I am asking in the motion that this council should put in a response to the Ministry of Justice, and my suggestion today, if procedurally it was all right, that as we, if the motion is agreed, which I hope it will be, that the Chief Executive undertake to prepare a response which was agreed by all group leaders. <coughs> group leaders. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm still smiling at the thought of um, Trevor and Richard as the landed gentry of <laughs> the latest century, but thank you for your contributions. Um, I think that what Gordon and Sarah had to say Um, about the effect on this council quite practically needs to be included and I think Mary Evans' point about um, the role of the press. Um, Thank you also um, both uh, Sonia and Sandy sorry I should say um, Councillor Barker, Councillor Martin for your um, support for the motion. Um, It's an interesting thought about legal aid and the effect on solicitors. I actually thought they were less busy because crime had fallen under this government but (laughs) <laughs> well done, well done. No, I, no she, she, she makes a, 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 a fair point, let's put it at that. Um, and Sandy, you're talking about it being our government. I think it was your government in 2003 that closed eight other courts in Suffolk. So let's join together today for what's best for Suffolk, for this council um, and for the people that we've been elected. And colleagues, I urge you... Um, to send a clear message to Westminster and the Department of Justice, um, the Westminster through our MPs, that the denial of local justice in the west and the north of this county of Suffolk is totally unacceptable. Bury St Edmund's motto is Shrine of the King, Cradle of the Law. We can't let that Cradle of the Law be lost from Suffolk. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, councillors, for a a lively and very informative debate. We will now move to the vote. I assume everyone's ready by now. Uh, I will now start the vote. Should I point out that we no longer have the present button? It's just um, uh, press 2 if you support the motion or if you don't agree with the motion, press 3 or 4 for, to abstain. Has everyone voted? Yeah. I'll now close the vote. Unanimous. How wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Therefore, motion one is carried.